Today's shear is about asking the right questions. And I thought to focus a little bit in the time we have this morning upon the issues of she'elot u'tshuvot, questions and answers at the Seder. Everybody knows Mani Shtana, Dalit Banim, to try to go a little bit more in depth to understand uh, a little bit more what the dynamic is and why that uh, interaction is so crucial for the fulfillment of the mitzvah of Sipur Yitziat Mitzvah, one of the major mitzvot of the night of uh, nights, in our case, of the Seder, is actually to tell the story and to do so in a particular manner. And then in general, as Jewish people, to be uh, a curious uh, people. Um, I don't know if it's really accurate, but I did read uh, years ago that the peoples now known as the native peoples of Canada, uh, who live very far north, we used to be called Eskimos, they're called the Inuit now, um, and I have another name, uh, they have many, many different words for snow because they know all the different types of snow that falls and they know a lot, that's their world. Jewish people have many, many, many words for question. Many words for question. If you look through the Talmud, there are many different ways that we can ask questions, different types of questions. We'll see some of those are embedded in the Haggadah, Shal Pesach, and deliberately so. Unlike last week's shear, which was much more, let's say, conceptual and on one basic theme, here you might say this is more variegated and maybe some nuggets without giving a lecture at your Leil HaSeder, but maybe more uh, exportable uh, that you could share with members of the, uh, uh, you know, at the Seder who are at the table with you. So let's, uh, let's go. Let's learn a little bit. Firstly, I came across this, the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs Haggadah, Rabbi Sachs, Zichon Livracha, last Pesach was with us, was fine. And uh, now he's, uh, he's uh, he left the world. Very hard to uh, wrap your head around. But uh, this is this is the reality of the world. We say Baruch Dina Emes on his loss. And he has a chapter in his Haggadah called The Art of Asking Questions. Um, Socrates, he writes, the great Greek philosopher and mentor of Plato was in the habit of asking disconcerting questions. To this day, persistent questioning in search of clarity is known as the Socratic method. For this habit, among other things, he was put on trial by the Athenians, accused of corrupting the young and sentenced to death. Nothing could be less like Judaism in which teaching the young to ask questions is an essential feature of Pesach. So much so that the Haggadah, the narration, must be in response to a question asked by a child. If there is no child present, adults must ask one another. And if one is eating alone, one must ask oneself. In Judaism, to be without questions is not a sign of faith, but a lack of depth. As for the child who does not know how to ask, you must begin to teach him how. Many of the customs of Seder night, dipping the parsley and removing the Seder plate are two examples, were introduced solely to provoke a child to ask why. Judaism is a religion of questions. Now look at the next paragraph. Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Tversky, Zichon Levracha, last Pesach was with us, unfortunately also left the world. These are people who pass into the Seder of the ages, and we can bring them, as it were, their memory uh, to our Siddharm and bring them alive, if you will. We have a tradition that when we recite the words of Tzadikim or of Chachamim, Siftotav Dovot Bekever, that it's as if their, their lips are moving in the, in the grave, meaning in Shamayim. This is uh, an awakening of the idea that their Neshama continues. So he quotes here, Amer Abraham Tversky, the American psychiatrist, remembers how when he was young, his teacher would welcome questions, the more demanding, the better. When faced with a particularly tough challenge, he would say in his broken English, you write, you hundred percent right. Now I show you where you wrong. Huh? The Nobel Prize winning Jewish physicist Isidore Rabi once explained that his mother taught him how to be a scientist. Every other child would come back from school and be asked, what did you learn today? But my mother used to ask instead, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? In the yeshiva, the home of traditional Talmudic learning, the highest compliment a teacher can give a student is du frekst agut akasha, you raise a good objection. Ayin Sham, the beautiful, magnificent uh, essays uh, in the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs Haggadah. But when I came across this and I saw on the same page, it's Rabbi Sachs and he's writing about Rabbi Dr. Tursky, thought, wow, can't pass it up. In Egypt, we experienced uh, bitterness. It's summarized in one pasuk, but uh, described in various ways throughout the uh, story that we find in Sefer Shemot, the actual narration about the crying out of the people. We find it in other places in the Torah, obviously, Parshat Arami Oved Avi and Parshat Kitavo in the book of Dvarim that we mentioned, we talked about last time, a section of it, and Vanitzak calling out to Hashem. But here, really encapsulated in one pasuk is a lot of 
challenge and difficulty and struggle. And they, the Egyptians, embittered the Jewish people's lives with hard work, with mortar, with bricks, with all kinds of work out in the field, outdoors in the field, uh, all of the kinds of ways that they made them work with backbreaking uh, labor. The pshat is clear, and it reflects the physical bondage the Jewish people endured. The Zohar Kadosh has a little bit of a different take. The Zohar sees it not to negate the level of pshat, but to see multiple levels and layers of meaning. And this other layer of meaning here is um, the idea that there's something going on in a spiritual level as well. And what the Zohar writes, uh, it's sometimes hard to understand and decode what the Zohar Akadosh is driving at, but first we'll just learn it at face value and then we'll plumb the depths again, not to negate the level of Pshat. I made this point, I think just this past Monday, it's not that these are in opposition to each other, it's functioning on different channels, different layers. The alien de la balishma, those who do not learn Torah, generally speaking, they don't engage with the words of Torah for their own sake, but rather an ulterior motive, rather for the sake of intellectual uh, knowledge, but not for avodat Hashem, etc., for service of God. Nafiklon maim maririn. They will remove, they will extract from this Torah uh, bitter waters. As it says, the Itmar Bahon, as it says, Vayimaru et chayehem avodat kasha, it says, they embittered their lives with difficult work, avodat kasha. Avodat kasha says the Zohar Kaddish, da kushia. That means problems, challenges, questions. Bechomer, with the mortar is re reread homiletically as da kalvachomer. Kalvachomer, that's when you see in the base matters the thumb of learning, not this way, but like this, a fortiori argument. Kalvachomer, if this is so, then of course that is so. All the more, so. that's what it means, right? That's the hand motion that goes with it. Bechomer da kalvachomer. What is uvil veinim with the bricks? Belibun halacha in the uh, in the purification or the the, the trying to figure out the halacha, but libun means with fire. So there's some kind of energy that has to be expended to extract it, a cryptic line from the Zohar HaKadosh. But seeing the idea of being in Egypt as being in a certain way confronted with questions, with challenges, with the idea of having to deal with kal vachomer, to expend energy, that it's challenging, that it's hard, that sometimes learning can be frustrating. And the idea of levenim, of the bricks, of trying to be malabin the halacha, to purify, clarify the halacha, but to do so through the input, if you will, of, uh, of fire. Now we have a tradition, according to the Gemara, Paskins this way, uh, if you will, that a mitzvah that is done shaloli shma, if, you know, if you didn't for ulterior motives, you're still going to be yotze the mitzvah. The Amarav Yehud Amarav Olam Yasuk Adam B'Torah V'Mitzvot Afa Pi Shaloli Shma. A person should be engaged in mitzvot and actions, even if it's not for the right reasons. Why? Mitzvah Shaloli Shma Bali Shma. If you do it Shaloli Shma, eventually you'll come to do it Lishma. If you did it originally not for its own sake, eventually you will come to do it for its own sake. So hopefully you'll get there. You're not there yet. You'll get there eventually. So that's that's the uh, the idea of the Gemara. It's interesting. The Zohar wants to under, us to understand a certain level, a certain plane, like um, uh, uh, how should I say it? The level of ideas, not just on physically what was, what's happening, but the idea that somehow a person who engages in Torah study and it's not for pure reasons of wanting to serve Hashem, but they have some ulterior motive that's bringing them in to do it. That's fine. You know, the Gemara says, but you should just be aware. So when it's Shalolishma, you're going to be left with questions and the you have to engage the Kalva Chomer and the Levanim, the Libun Halacha. It's all very mysterious. Came the Admor Azakein of Chabad, the Torah Or, uh, also known as the Baal Hatanya. He wrote a parish on Chumash called the Torah Or. It's very, very deep. I'm giving you a small extract, a small taste, just to understand some of the methodology and some of what he did. He incorporated this, uh, this line from the Zohar HaKadosh and its application maybe for what it means the Jewish people went down into Egypt. So there's a certain shorthand that he uses in order to write. I'm gonna give you the, the executive summary edition and we'll read just a few lines within it. But he basically starts pointing out the distinctions between the Jewish people going to Egypt in the book of Breshit at the end of the book, and then it's repetition in the book of Shmot at the beginning. 
and various words that are um, uh, the phraseology is somewhat differentiated from one to the other. And why, why, why might that be? And he wants to try to understand that, but of course, is the way of the Admira Zakein. It's not just a, uh, a word play. There's obviously very much uh, a certain depth uh, 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 perception that he has about seeing the different levels and layers and how he teases out lessons uh, uh, from it. Um, in this case, I think um, uh, sort of rather uh, practical in terms of having a conceptual framework when it comes to learning. Says the, uh, the uh, Admor Hazaken, he writes, he says, he shows a few differences here and there. And then he notes that it's told to us twice that they went down. They went down in Sefer Breshit, they went down in Sefer Shemot. They only went once, but it's recounted twice. So he says this is really related to the reality that initially when the brothers came down to Egypt to speak before uh, the viceroy of the Pharaoh in front of uh, Tzafnat Paneach, unbeknownst to them, was their brother. They said, Yarod Yaradnu, but Lisbor Ochel. In Parak Mem Gimel, chapter 43, they say, uh, please, my, they said, please, my master, we came down, we came down. It's twice. Yerida Ach Yerida. They went down twice. There's two descents. Bechain Bietziat Mitzrayim Geul Aktiv, also in the leaving Egypt. This is really chapter 46. I should have given you the Pasuk. He quotes it here in shorthand. God tells Yaakov Avinu as he's going down to Egypt, don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. I will raise you up and raise you up. Later on, when the Jewish people are in the desert and they falter in their sense of purpose and Khalid ben Yafuna wants to encourage them, Parshat Shlach, what it say? Always the doubling of language. Anochi al alo. And also, twice the, the going up and the going up. So why is that? There's an elevation or an emergence and then another emergence. The truth is when Jewish people got out of Egypt, they only went up once, if you will. As the Torah says, I will lift you up, raise you up from the poverty and the suffering that is Egypt. El Ered Zavat Chalavad Vash to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Ach, ki aliyah zu hashenit, excuse me, ki romezet al geula ha'ati daliyot, b'meher b'menu amen. That's a hint to the elevation that will come at the end of days, meaning that the geula shleima. And he said, this is what is being spoken already, uh, already when Moshe is standing at the Sneh, uh, Moshe was already told essentially that there will be a final redemption. Rashi writes it this way in the Torah, uh, or hints to it at least that Shem says, I will be with you as I will be with you, or I am as I, or I will be as I will be. So Rashi writes, I will be with you in this, sorry, as I will be in the future. And Moshe is saying, what do you mean? There's going to be a future one, right? There's some hints already in the text of the Torah that Hashem is telling Moshe, this isn't going to be the last servitude, and it's not going to be the last redemption either. So the hinek tiv kimeit seit chem eretz mitzrayim or enu niflaot. The pasuk I gave you down below from the book of Micha, talking about the end of days, that it will be like the like the time of leaving Egypt. I will show you great wonders when you leave, i.e., the final uh, uh, exile to the final redemption. So um, and the idea that this verse connects, links, links the leaving of Egypt with the and it's redemption from Mitzrayim and the redemption, the final redemption. So there's some connection between the two, and it's like a parallel circumstance. Writes the Torah, or, As the purpose, the, 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 the stated purpose of the 210 years of slavery and servitude, so the Jewish people would merit being able to receive the Torah and to encounter Hashem, as it were, face to face, as the Torah describes in Parshat Shemot, Haot, this is the sign, God tells Moshe. What is the sign? He says, what's the sign? Here's the sign. When you take them out of Egypt, you will bring them to this mountain. So it's with reference to what's coming and the sense of trajectory that the tar pits and sand pits that they're in, in Egypt, the building structures built on sand, the, the great labor that they're engaged in, it's all to ready them to be able to encounter Hashem. So too, the length of all of this exile, it's in order to be able to reveal 
inner aspects of the Torah, uh, things that we don't even understand yet about the Torah that will become apparent only once we get to, so to speak, the end of time. At the time of Matan Torah was the, was the uh, revelation of the Torah that was revealed. But the revelation of that which is the hidden dimensions of Torah will not truly transpire until the end of days. Um, I would add here, here parenthetically, according to the tradition of the Hasidim, the Kabbalistic tradition, of course, there were many Sitre Torah, secrets of Torah that were conveyed at Harsina, but it wasn't to the general populace, that these elements came into the foreground more so than they had been before at the time of Rabbi Shun Bar Yochai, Rabbi Akiva, that era, that Kufa, in the wake of the Churban, sort of, you could say, to tide everyone over until the end of days. That's what the, the, the um, Admor Azakin seems to be saying. And that's what it means. I'll show them wondrous things. They'll see it in the future, but I have, we haven't even gotten there yet. There's something else that's coming. Not a new revelation of a new Torah, Chalila. That only happened once. But new dimensions, inner dimensions within the Torah. So says the Torah or. And now I bring together all these mysterious little disparate parts that I mentioned um, from Baimarot Chayim, etc. This is exactly as it's described with regard to the exile and the subjugation in the exile of Egypt. It also has reference to what's going to be at the end of days. Their lives were embittered, refers to the Torah was made somewhat bitter. Uh, uh, because that is our lifeblood. Vayimaru, their lives were embittered. What was embittered? The Torah. Bavoda kasha, challenging work. What's the work? Kasha, da kushya, confronting questions. Bechomer, with the mortar. Da kalvachomer, that's the use of kalvachomer. Uvacholva daba sadeh, all of the work in the, in the, uh, in the field. Da brita, right? That's, uh, that's the, that which is external to the, to the Mishnah, to the redacted editions that you have to try to always reconcile with the Mishnah itself. The words, the Brita, are the teachings of the era of the Tanayim, the sages of the Mishnah, whose words were not redacted at the official version. I'll just compare and contrast. Uvi Levenim, da libun hilchata. And what is the Levenim? The bricks made by fire. That's the fiery kiln of Halacha that's trying to forge um, the... the um, uh, or, or fire, I should say, fire the uh, the halacha to to refine it. Shein biadenu halacha brura b'din baru ki kol dina hatorah b'machloket shnuya halalu machshirin umatan v'lo posn utmeyin. Because the truth is, the halacha when we're in galut, the halacha is not clear. There's so many arguments, so many discrepancies. These people say pasul. These say, people say uh, uh, that it's that it's a, a kasha. These people say ta. These people say tame. There's a process, sometimes an arduous process, one that is sometimes rife with conflict, a machloket, which we hope is uh, played out l'shem shemayim. But a challenge, a frustration. We're trying. We're striving, etc. Says the Admar Zaken, because there's an element of galut, of exile. It, the Torah itself, if you will, is being refined through this process, through our engagement with it. Not the Torah itself is perfect. Torah Hashem Tamim and Meshivat Nafesh. It's our engagement with it that needs the the application. So just as the subjugation Egypt through the mortar and the bricks, enabled the Jewish people to be ready to receive the Torah. So too, when we clarify the halacha in our time, so too, in the future, the redemption will be a result of, well, not, maybe not a result, I didn't say that, but there'll be a, a, a revelation of the inner dimension of Torah thanks to the, the, um, the great efforts that are expended now in learning. Sometimes that involves struggles, sometimes that involve problems and challenges and an inability to understand the ins and outs of what it is that we confront when we look at a piece of learning. But the engagement with it itself has great merit and should not be taken uh, 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 lightly. Let me pause here for questions in case anyone has them. And please let me know. No? Total silence? I'm, th okay. I'm thinking of that phrase that the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. So in some sense, the reward 
for learning is learning. Good, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do and, we and assume the, the, that the, the point is that there's a process of refinement. There's a process that's going on. There's a process that's, that's unfolding, right? And and um, you know the idea that we're we're trying to um, we're we're trying to engage that process, um, if you will. Like we said, we talked about this last time. Uh, the the way in which the um, the uh, the uh, the Gemara describes um, a Mishnah describes already matchil beginut umesayim b'shvach we begin with denigration we end with praise well how do we get there on the level of ideas first there's a struggle first there's confronting questions yeah first there's the idea that we have to um, uh, what's the word um, uh, uh, recognize what, what, to know what we don't know yeah. And it's easier said than done. Um, what, what, what is going on here, though, just to understand the, the idea that there is, according to the Admor Azakin, to sum up what he said, he said, the Jewish people went down to Egypt twice. It's a repetition. It's, it's a big, big Torah. I'm going to give you like a little piece of it. But they went down twice, and they came up. It describes that they're going to come up twice. But then when they actually come up, it says they only came up once. All right? It doesn't say like, halo ha'aleti. So this is ale, uh, like I'm going to do it like one time. So where's the other one? Well, because the story of leaving Egypt is a temp, not just a story that happened, it's also a template for what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And right, the, the idea of laying down tracks. Go ahead, someone had a comment? Yeah, I was just, I just thought that if there are many questions, can we also assume that there are many answers? And that yes. the, the question, and the question of, and it involves like a debate between the uh, uh, arguing about what's the right, there really is no right answer. It's a question of debating what the right answer is, and the debate is the, the process of learning through the debating. Excellent. That's excellent. That's excellent. That's correct. By the way, I'm going to tweak just one thing that you said just ever so slightly. It's not that there are no right answers. It's that we might not be able to access the right answers, meaning we, 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 we're, we're, that's, we're, trying to, we're trying to get at what it might be. We have a shared basic set of assumptions, obviously, how we're getting there, meaning you know, we, we, we agree that two plus two equals four. We agree, agree that that uh, God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at our Sinai. We agree the basic rules of interpretation, right? It's not that it's flung wide open to the point where, you know, uh, you want to turn the whole Seder upside down, that it means something that, that it doesn't. But you're absolutely right. There's this there's a wide range. I mean, there's, look and look at the Haggadah as an example, you know, uh, uh, pages and pages and pages uh, uh, of, um, of, of discourse uh, debate on debate. And debate and debate exactly about you know what it, what actually what's the meaning of this what's the meaning of that trying to ferret it out but the, the the acknowledgement here is you know what there's a sometimes there's a frustrating element to it sometimes there's like yeah, I, well, why can't it be so clearer wouldn't it be easier process, for us you know it's a process of it's a process of trying to find the right answer that's the, right right the right exactly you're, you're exactly. engaged in the process of trying to find the right answer, even though there is no right answer right Right. There is there is, no well, right well, here's answer. the thing. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm trying to parse. You say the right answer. Well, it isn't the. Is it the absolute the right answer? We have our tradition is uh, there. There's a vote among the sages. There, we decide. Okay, done. Yeah. Good. Get many there. Rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Helen, go ahead. I'm sorry. You go okay. ahead. Okay. Thank okay, you for that. This is, thank you, but this is expounding to a bigger problem that frustrates me. I have a table with four legs. The two legs. One of is my yeshlach bias that I have to deal with something tangible for a miracle or some good story to start working. And then the Habor Reik Abel Mind that Rashi is explaining, there's a lot of hidden, very basic information that we need as we delve. Yeah. The other two legs, completely the opposite. The Hasna Enena Ukal, it never burns out. The Hine Be'er Mayim, the Hogger miraculously sees the body of water. Okay. So two we have that are based in reality, kind of a called the Homer uh, and reality. The other one is all based on kind of miraculous behavior. Okay. Now, where in Jewish thought in this thing, which way is the right way? I mean, if I understand your question correctly, I, I think they're I think they're intention. I think there's 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 both of these. You know, both of these. Um, well, that's why I think like a flashlight, you got the positive and the negative. And somehow the two of them are holding each other up. 
but I don't know how. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, so, I mean, um, because I, you're going into the Zohar before we did a lot of Mayesh Bayas concepts. Right. We've, done, we've so, dealt with that. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right, right. So I mean, where you're, do we you're, stand in, sure. in philosophy, you know? I, I I understand, and 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 honestly, the, the, I think they I think they're. It's fair to say that uh, that they're uh, that they're intention. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. I, I don't think I can say about it. I mean, do you accept it's possible to just these are these are themes that are that are intentional with each other, and they they play out in different times and in different circumstances depending on the. Um, I think. Well, the problem is when we get to the story about the sea having fruit trees coming out of the side. Yeah. Uh, it gets a bit magnificent. Okay. For the average person. I, 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 we should probably parse that medrash at another time. That right. medrash is, there's a question about medrash generally. How literally are you taking this, the, that which the medrash says? How literally do you really want to take it? And I have said many times, I'll say again now, I could see two perfect Jews. Uh, back to Deanne's point, you know, is there a right answer? I see two perfect Jews, one perfect Jew, one Jew says, I take this literally. If that's what it says in the Medrash, absolutely that's what happened. I could see another Jew, the Jew, by the way, who follows the Derech of the Rambam. I'm more that <laughs> second Jew, who says you don't necessarily take every Medrash literally. The fact is that Medrashim often contradict each other. It can't be okay. the it's one thing and the opposite. Very often there are these magnificent, like as you said, these the fantastic stories that are told. That that's not that's not what's going on. Now the Zohar that I'm quoting here, though, I want I want you to understand it's it's okay. it's making it's not that the people in Mitzrayim were sitting in the base madrash and they were learning with the thumb and that was their pain. No, the pshat is they were slaves. That's what it means. They were slaves. But the point is. Is there a process, an arduous process of learning that means confronting questions and having to engage? And is there a certain um, reality that needs to be confronted as a process, a redemptive process ultimately, but one that could take a very long time, 210 years for the people in Egypt, if you will, so that it would be meritorious to stand at Sinai. And then a story also of the general story of Jewish history that we are still in the middle of that will culminate in the revelation of not a new Torah, but new inner dimensions of Torah. How do we get there? It's through all of these arduous intellectual processes, which are themselves to engage in learning. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of this that uh, the Zohar points out that it's people who are learning Shalom Lishma, people who are on a low level. If you're learning Lishma, apparently it's much easier. But if you're not learning for the right reasons, that's not to cast aspersions on all the wonderful people who learn Torah, but it's to say that there is an element, perhaps, of I want to seek the truth because it's Hashem's truth, or I want to seek the truth because there's an independent thing called truth. Those are not the same thing. This, the latter is not a theological statement, and it can become an end in and of itself. Um, I talked about, we talked about this a little bit on, on Purim, Purim time. That's the, the Faustian bargain that Haman makes, if you will. His drive is for knowledge. He could care less about God. He doesn't care about Hashem. He cares about himself and his own ideas that are themselves perhaps um uh what shall i say um i mean they're wicked but aside from that they're 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 the self the self-serving yeah they're 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 looking they're looking for a self-aggrandizement they're not really about a quest for an engagement with hashem yeah so look with me here isn't it interesting that the main stars of the show so to speak at the seder davka are people who are oftentimes there, um, of course, on a certain level, the purest, the most wonderful, but on a certain level also, they need to be engaged on and on with a lot of different gizmos to make sure that they stay engaged. Maybe they're not exactly there, Lishma, but we give them the currency that they know and we keep them there. He used to give out the uh, little uh, nuts, little little things he would give the kids. Uh, so they don't fall asleep at the Seder. Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, we grab the matzah on the night of Pesach. Different ideas about what that means. Either it means the they would pick it up 
and move it around and each person would touch it. And this year, that's definitely not going to happen. But generally, a hand in hand to hand so the children would see why. Some say that this is the, the, the hint in the Gemara, the roots, maybe the idea of people who would, uh, you know, take the Afikomen and conceal it, that all of that stemmed from the time of this Gemara, that it was already being described here. In other words, kids, they're amazing, but it's very hard to keep their attention. You know, today you would say, because everyone has a nut allergy and, and whatnot, you get them in Clive, it goes in little shells and little, little um, uh, nuts to eat, to play with. No, you're going to give them candy. You're going to load the table with candy. So that's their currency. Would you like it? Stay away. If you answer the question, if you can't, right? So that engagement. So on one level, the children are pure and amazing. And of course, they're only there because, you know, they love what they learned. If they were Zoha to learn it in school. But another level, like we know how it works. You got to keep them engaged. And that might mean uh, some would say, you know, uh, giving it, pay, paying them off with their currency, keeping them, you know, curious, keeping them involved. And you see it right there, I think, in the persona of the of the kids themselves and the, the presence of children at a Seder itself. And that, that's the beginning of the process. Uh, the adults who are maybe more laden with their tough questions about life and the world, their questions are not as easily answered. And there's much easier, oftentimes, answers given to children, question, answer, question, answer, than as the question, the child grows and the questions become more, more challenging. Uh, sometimes unanswerable, in fact. We learned this Mishnah already last time. Uh, the Mishnah Masech Psachim, uh, the, the second cup is poured. The Kana Ben Shoel Aviv, the child asks their father. We saw this last time. We had the Be'eming Dat Be'ben Aviv Malamdo. If the child has no knowledge, then the father must teach the child. So that's the idea, right? Uh, the, the Manishtana is listed here, the original version of the Manishtana. And... Um, the, the Gemara, as if putting a, the Mishnah rather, putting a, a parenthesis on the other side, according to the knowledge of the child, the father should teach. Yeah, the Gemara un unpacks this. Right? If his son is wise, then he can ask. If the child doesn't know, then the wife should ask. That's what the Gemara describes. And if not, meaning if the person is... Um, uh, by themselves, even they have to ask themselves. Even if they know everything, the ins and outs of the of the seder, and the two wise people, one has to ask the other. The notion of she'ela and tshuva, asking and answering. And here, the Rambam in codifying this halacha in his Hilchot Chametz Umatza writes: the Kana Ben Shoel. Here, the child asks, and then we have Omer Hakore. The one who is the reader, the like the seder leader, is going to read the words Manishtana Halayla Zemikola Lot, etc. etc. So here the child asks, step one. Step two, the reader will then read Manishtana Halayla Zet. Writes Rabbi Soloveitchik in his Haggad, in the Haggadah written, he didn't write it, but it was written by his, his grandson um, and put together. Ubir Divre Harambam Nira Dishne Dinim Namru. There are two halachas in this in this one sentence. Reishit first. Child should ask what they're curious about. It says when your child will ask. When asked according to what they know. The Torah spoke as against the four sons. The old Namra halacha. It also says another halacha. The Two things we learn. One, that the child must ask whatever it is that, uh, that uh, uh, makes them curious, that they wonder about. That's not the manishtana. That's formulaic already. That's the kore. The reader does that. First, the child is to ask something that actually bothers them, that makes them think and are wondering about. Number one. Number two, the whole way of Sipri Tzim Mitzrayim has to be in the manner of asking questions and giving answers. V'lachain, therefore, katav harambam degam ha-kore tzarich lomar manishtana kidei shigam Sipri Tzim Mitzrayim atzmati hiya now, therefore, the reader has to go back again and ask the question so that there's a formula of asking and answering that is baked into the words of the, of the Haggadah and to the mitzvah of Sipur Tziat Mitzrayim. I saw also in that Haggadah mentioned that Rabbi Soloveitchik reported that in his grandfather's house, Rabbi Chaim's house, everybody said the Manishtana, not just the kids, but every, they went from youngest to oldest. Every single person would recite the Manishtana, so they were all involved in the uh, in the in the formula, a back and forth, you know, uh, 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 discourse, 
on the uh, on the subject. Okay, let's go to the next uh, the next slide. Okay, so here we go. I went too far. Where was I? Over here. Manishtan alayla zemikola elot. Everybody knows what these these words are. Another year we can analyze each one of them in depth. We're going to analyze a couple of them, perhaps if we have time today. Uh, the Reb Sadaka Cohen of Lublin and his Haggadah also wants to approach this question about the que about having the the formula question answer question answer as a dialogue. Uh, you might say today a Socratic method, but we had it as the Judaic method uh, before. Uh, Socrates, apparently. The Gemara Psachim, Lechem Oni. Why is it called Lechem Oni? Bread of poverty, but it's written as Oni in this way, or bread of oppression or affliction is sometimes translated. The Gemara, one of its interpretations is that we respond or recite many things in its presence. It has to be in the manner of questions and answers. The, the child asks, the father answers. As it says, if not, then if he has no son, then his wife should ask. If there's no one there, then he asks himself. And we also find this with regard to Rabbi Gamliel. Uh, the matzah that we're eating, uh, for what reason do we eat it? So what's the function of that? It's that we go through each thing, question, answer. We don't just say, we don't just say it that way. We do it in the manner of Shele Tshuva, and that is the girsa of the Rosh, the version of the Rosh in the Gemara, uh, 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 the Mishnah, rather, that is quoted there from Pesachim. Writes the coin from Lublin. A person at nighttime, in this night particularly, needs to feel something new within their soul. I have to see themselves, how do you experience that? The person feel, should feel emotionally that uh, in their soul, I left tonight. This is the night I left from the straits. Every night of Pesach, every year, should feel like Yilu should not be like a routine matter for that individual. That's the whole reason why we have that that uh, the first dipping early in the seder. Amru shehu ki hechi delahave hekerel tinokot, so the children will recognize that something is up. Vanishit or haadam manishtana halayla zami kolalot she shinu bezet v'yetze meahergel. What is the coin from Lublin basically saying? The point of the sheila and tshuva by asking it as a question and then giving the answer. That's in order to. Um, almost wet the appetite. It's like a uh, that which opens up the 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 sense of the feeling. It refines that feeling. But you have to pose it first as a question in order to get to the response. It has to be a gap practically between the two. The questions will be to awaken, to arouse this feeling. And it could not be done if we were just reading it as a text. Therefore, it's a question, and then the answer. I would just add putting the pause in between the question and the answer allows for the contemplation uh, uh, of it. I think today they call this the uh, the curiosity gap of being able to formulate the right questions in order to spark a desire to hear the answers. If it's just gonna be statements, so that's not productive, not, not, not bringing people uh, um, um, to engage with the, um, with, the, um, with the new learning that they ought to do. And it's challenging. The more we know, the more we have to struggle to come to the Seder and feel um, that we learned something new, that we're gaining new insight that perhaps we didn't have uh, uh, before, but we, we, we strive to do it. One of my teachers pointed out that in order for you to learn something new, you can't just start from the middle of a story which has no reference frame of reference to an individual's life and knowledge. Therefore, there has to always be as if one needs to attach whatever new knowledge. If it was a piece of land you were attaching to a, uh, to a continent, you can't throw the, the, the dirt, the clods of dirt into the ocean, they get washed away. You need to attach them to the existing land, the solid, the terra firma, if you will, of the knowledge base in order to build it outward. What therefore, and I guess that's in a, in a way what the country is talking about. The whole point of asking this as a study in contrast is 
everything moves around at a baseline. There's a disruption here. There's a curiosity here because of those changes. To whet the appetite is to start with all of those conscious shibacholot versus halayla hazeb. Okay, next slide. The Svat Emet saw these four questions as actually related and lined up with the four sons that are coming later. Hadalad she'ilad shebamani shtana nisteru al hadalad banim. They're listed in, they're lined up with each of the four children. Ki amatza hu ha'edut umitzvot shetziva lanu Hashem barach. The matza represents the salvation, etc. And it's the testimony to the all of the mitzvot that Hashem gave us that were surrounding the matzah. Remember, the Jewish people are leaving Egypt. The only the, the main food items are the korban pasach and the uh, and the matzah. And the matzah ends up being, till now, the one that we end up doing the biblical mitzvah of eating that has the most so far, unfortunately, staying power. We don't have a korban pasach now. More on that some other time. But the matzah is that is that declaration uh, and represents that. The maror that's the bitterness, the question of the rasha that he does not uh, want to experience bitterness, and therefore, ma'avod azot lachem. And the answer then to the ben Arasha is lahakot shinav, to blunt the teeth. Does not mean literally to hit somebody. Blunting the teeth means you uh, blunt, you, 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 uh, what would the expression be in English today, other than blunting one's teeth? You know, it's a, it's a rejoinder to get them to, to be quiet, but because you, you put them in their place, I guess, would be the expression. Ki adaraba. Uh, the, 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 you blunt the teeth of the of the Russia by saying, you know why we have Maror? It's because of people like you. From his vantage point, there wouldn't have ever been a redemption because the whole thing seems like one tedious task. So lining up question one with the Chacham, question two with the uh, with the Ben Arasha. Ha'seba was not one of the original questions, by the way, but it is quite one of the questions for the last... 2,000 years, let's say. So he says it lines up with the She'ela of the Tam. Mazot, Sushinu HaNikaret, Beguf Yeshiva Adam. It's something that can be seen even in the posture of the people. And that's what animates him. He wants to already know why we're sitting differently than we normally do. And the Shnei Tibulin, the two uh, dippings that we do, one of the, of the Harosa, of the, excuse me, of the Karpas, later on of the Maror, who Rakadeshi Yavin Aben Lishol, it's in order to, uh, to, to have them ask a question. It's to bring about the questions. It says the Gemara, it should be something that the children should notice. Something is different and it will cause them to want to ask that which they didn't hear before, didn't realize that they should ask previously. So um, as opposed to the Haseba, which I would say the Ben Atam, has questions formulated already from the get-go and just see something different right away. What is this? The Ben She'enu Deli Shol needs more time. The Shnei Tibulin are factored into the two dippings, one at the beginning, that might not be enough. The second one, that's gonna be only later on after the Magid section. It's more of a drawing out of the one who does not initially have a, uh, what's the word, a, a, a point of comparison to even think about, to wanna to try to ask questions uh, uh, about. Let me pause here for a minute, come up for air. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, in that case, let's move on. So the next, uh, the next section of the, um, uh, of, of the, the um, sort of understanding the questions, I wanna dive down to each of the four, each of the four sons about asking those right questions, right? We know the questions uh, of the four children, we've seen them many, many times. And we note that the Chacham and the Tam have something in common. What they have in common is that this Pasuk, which we analyzed last time, we talked about it in depth, is actually here prefaced by the words, Kishach bin Chamachar Lemor, your son will ask you tomorrow. To which Rashi says, Yesh Machashu Achar Zman. There's a, sometimes a tomorrow that means after an extended period of time. The other one though, the Tam, Mahu Omer, we have it here, Mazot, and you shall answer, etc. Now the Tom asks also, also asking about tomorrow, and says, Mazot. You answer, it's exactly as we have it in the Haggadah. Rashi, in the, on the Pasuk, the verse in the book of Shemot, which is for the Ben Atam, writes the same thing. Yesh Yesh 
uh, such as this one, which is about the morrow, meaning in the future. Uchigon, machar yom In the future, your children will say to our children of B'nai God and B'nai Ruven. If you remember that story from Sefer Yoshua about the way in which B'nai God and B'nai Ruven were dwelling in another location. They were just over the, uh, the Jordan and they uh, built basically not a bridge, but they had like a, a Mizbeach on the eastern bank of the Jordan. And the rest of you people were like, what are you saying to them? What are you doing? They said, well, you know, we want to show that we're connected to you, et cetera. And there's a dialogue there, uh, a dialogue between children, a dialogue between tribes. I think it's not accidental Rashi threw that in here in terms of there will be tomorrow. Machar Yomru, your sons will say to our sons, means the Bnei Gadim Yeruven on one side of the Jordan and the rest of the tribes on the other, meaning how is the family still connected? Um, and these two, now back to our, that was sort of a, a digression. But here, the idea that both the Ben HaChacham and the Ben HaTam, both have Kishach Ben HaMachar Lemar, there's some question will be answered in the future that needs to be contended with, that needs to be um, assimilated uh, and, and, and uh, internalized. And to try to understand a little bit on a deeper level, what is the contrast between these two questions? One is obviously very detailed, and the other one is just two questions as such. Many, many answers have been propounded. I want to share with you something new that you may not have uh, have seen before. It's, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Rashi points out that Tinok is the, uh, excuse me, the Mazot of the Ben Atam is the Tinok Tipesh. Uh, he has no, no in-depth, there's no depth question what he asks. And therefore, he asks in a basic, uh, um, um, what's the word? A very terse manner, right? And uh, and therefore, later on in the Torah, we'll say, Ma'edavachukim, that's the Sheila of the Ben Achacham. Yeah? They're here, Rashi tells you already in the book of Shemot, Dibra Torah, Kinneged Arba Abanim, Rashi of Shein Deli Shol, Vashoel, Derech Stuma, Vashoel, Derech Achma. We have all four sons. The Torah spoke as against these four children. Rashi just quotes it already in the book of Shemot and Parshat Bo. Okay, so to try to understand again a little bit better on these four sons, the types of questions that they ask, and since we're up to the first son first, the Chacham, we'll go in, in order. The Chacham asks this detailed questions opposed to the child who is the Tom, but you see the connection between the two? They're both gonna ask in the future. The Benarasha doesn't ask, he says, and the Shem Dishol doesn't have questions. But the two who have questions, the questions will come in the future, something about the future. There's um, a, 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 a Rav right now, and he lives today, still in New York. His name is Rav Avram Shor, and uh, he has his svarim called the Lekach Valibuv, and he has an essay on this exact uh, uh, subject. So we don't have time to read the whole thing inside. He says, I'm going to tell you a Torah based on, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, on the Toldot Yaakov Yosef from his Sefer Kol Aryeh. But in order to explain it to you, he says, let me tell you the following. On the night of Pesach, there are great spiritual lights shining. You can't see them with your eyes, but it's a very spiritual time. Great lights, he says, come down from on high. And a person is, uh, as it were, uh, pushing away whatever the trials and challenges are of this world. And they are in a, a particular environment, at least for the period of time of the Seder. The challenge is that it doesn't last, that there is gonna be a tomorrow. That after this Seder, um, we want to know what we can take from the Seder with us. Uh, the day after the first Seder, the second night, we actually even start the count of Sfirat HaOmer. And then we have to try to do everything on our own. We're counting up to the 50th rung. There's a reference to the Purim story from, from a few weeks ago. 49 levels. We don't actually reach the, the 50th is Matan Torah that comes on from on high. We can't actually access it except if Hashem right, shares it with us. And he doesn't actually really share it with us. He shares with us a, an image of it, if you will. And back to Deanne's point from before. So we're at wondering, so what's the right answer? Like we're trying to get to the truth. We're trying to get to the truth that Hashem is conveying to us through the Torah. And that's what we receive on that 50th day, but that's the elements of it to the point of the Torah or of the Admiral Zuck and there's parts that are still left beyond our grasp and that will only be revealed in the future in terms of the, the, uh, the layers of it. So here's the following story. You can tell this story at your Seder. It's a, a, a brief story, but it's a well-known story in the world of Hasidut from the Maggid of Mezerich. The Maggid of Mezerich says that there is, he had, had the uh, allegory of a prince who was walking through darkness in a great forest. 
And in the darkness of this forest, he is looking for his way back home. Suddenly, Pitom, right? And he qu quotes the story here. I'm going to send you, by the way, that this these source sheets will be as a PDF. You can have it. It'll be online at rabbitcangle.org. It's the site that I have to upload it. Eventually, be uploaded to the Shul site. That just takes a little bit of a longer time. You're welcome to find it there. Upitom, ba or gadol. Suddenly, there's a great light. And the version I heard of the story the first time, it said it was actually a great bolt of lightning uh, that, that caused that illumination. So there's a flash. And so he sees the path forward to the palace. Even though the light will go out immediately. He can no longer see the palace of the king. He has now at least more of a desire that's drawing him forward. And he knows he knows that there is a path forward to get to the palace. Now he knows also that it will be an arduous process, that he'll still bump into things. And he knows that he's going to have to grope his way through the darkness. And it will be a challenge. But eventually, at least he has his sights now set at a higher point, at a point of destination and arrival. Says the Alek of Alibu of Avram Shor, is the same thing that's going on. Right? The same kind of idea that as we have emerged from the Seder, so Cain Belel Pesach, Yordim Ha'arat Umagbim, we have this spiritual light shining, Magbim Era Adam Ad Roma Malot, we go up a very high level. And why? Afterward, what's going to happen? Now you have to earn it on your own. You know where you have to get to. That gives you the courage to be able to go there. He continues. This is the question of the Chacham. What's the question of the Chacham? He's asking his, his uh, uh, parents, Tyra, Zisa, Tata, Vimama, what it's going to be tomorrow. What's going to be when the Seder is packed up? What's that day after the Pesach? When I did those mitzvot, it was very exciting. I was at a seder. It was, it was beautiful, magnificent, wondrous. But, but I don't feel that now. The morrow, the next day, afterward. If I have no illumination from those mitzvot, the next day in Cain, if so, then what was the point of doing the mitzvot on the night of Pesach if I can't take those lights, meaning that infusion of ruchnit, of connection to Hashem, forward? Oh, the Tom is also asking the same question. He's also asking about the contrast, what was before and what's going on after, excuse me, during the Seder and then after Seder. He doesn't have the language skill, the ability to evoke the feeling through the, his words. He can't verbalize it. He can't ask about ma'edot, v'achukim, v'amishpatim, what are these, this, 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 asher tziva Hashem, right? He's just asking in a general way, Mazur, what is this? He feels, he feels he fell from the levels that he was at previously. He wishes he was there, but he's just not there anymore. The answer is, God took us out with a strong hand. Piresh, at the time that he left Egypt, the Jewish people were not really worthy of redemption either. They were on the 49th level of, of impurity. And therefore, Hashem had to cause them to be raised up in a manner of skipping, jumping, jumping levels. With a strong hand. This approximates what we talked about last week in the Shir. You can sort of build a bridge to it about the idea of the notion the Jewish people were ambivalent or some number of them were ambivalent altogether about leaving. Therefore, the 49 days of Sphira start right after leaving Egypt. Day one, two, three. I'm growing a little each day. I'm getting higher a little each day. I have to work on it, though. It's not just counting. It has to come with, with the work. That's every generation like that, therefore. That in every generation, the person is raised up from their own They're lifted up out of their personal straits. They're skipped out of it on the night of on the nights of Pesach. 
ואחר כך, מוטלו להגביע את עצמו על ידי עבודתו בכל פרט ופרט, בימי הספירה. Then you have to do it on your own in the days of the sphere that come after. And that's the answer for the Chacham and for the Ben Atam. Let me dial back and show you what happened here. So again, you have the question of the Chacham. It's very detailed. Asked about types of mitzvahs. Yeah, the question of the Tam makes no mention of any of that. Says, what is th what's this? But when you look it up in the Torah, it turns out they're both referencing something about a tomorrow. Only those two ask about tomorrow. So Rashi understands it to mean it means in the future, in future generations, you'll be asked this. But here, Lekach Ve'alibu, based on this Torah from the Tolet Yaakov Yosin, the Sefer Kol Arye, and based on this um, allegory from the Magad of Mezrit, says, no, the point is, I had a vision of what it would be like to be close to Hashem. And what's, what's tomorrow? How am I supposed to get there afterward? How do I get there to the next, sort of the next level now that I was saw it, but now I was removed from it? How do I get back there? So now we watch, watch this. What's the answer to the Ben HaChacham? Bala Gada Shashina B'Shed HaChacham V'Afata Emorlo. And you should also tell the, 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 the wise son. Don't get dizzy, but I got to flip back to show to you. I'm sorry, I should have put it there, right? After the question of the Chacham, what's the answer? V'af, ata, and more like Yechad Pesach. And you should tell him all of the laws of Pesach. We do not uh, uh, eat after we finish the Korban Pesach. We don't eat another dessert. We finish eating the Korban Pesach, the last thing. Says like a Ve'alibuv. So it's l'mashim l'vad ma'ashikotav ki b'chozek yad, shezet tshuva al sibat ha'davar, lama ha'davar kein, shalamacha notli mimenu ha'arot, even though we're answering for the Ben Hatam. Uh, that with a strong hand is taken out. What are you saying to the child who is the, the wise child? What was the point of the mitzvah of Pesach? And here comes the answer. This is what you should say to him. In addition to what's written in the Torah, what's written in the Torah? God took us out of Egypt with a strong hand, with a mighty, right? The, the answer that's there. You should tell him something else. Tell him something else. What do you tell the wise child? Because the wise child can understand this. Tell the child uh, with regard to just like the laws of Pesach, that it's a strange formulation, as in the laws of Pesach, or in the manner of the laws of Pesach, that we don't eat anything after the Pesach. We don't have another dessert after. But Tam is in Vurba Gemara. she share Tam Matzah Befiv? So that the taste of the matzah will still be in your mouth when you finish the seder, says the lekach velibu. What are you saying to the ben achacham? Tell him all the laws of Pesach and remind him that at the end of all things you did these mitzvahs. Kena mitzvah shalal Pesach and bechin azu. That's the same manner of the mitzvahs the night of Pesach. Shadei mashemagish tama mitzvah. You feel the taste of mitzvahs on the night of Pesach, and you're raised on being rolled to the dargazu. You come up to that level. You should take that taste with you beyond the Seder. When the question comes the next day, so what about all those mitzvahs? What am I, how am I supposed to bring myself to a spiritual level of connection to Hashem, to the Eid al and Mishpatim? Oh, you answer him. Yeah, you remember the taste? Remember that? That's why it says, therefore you should say to him, like the halacha of the Pesach, just like. And comparative. Just like with regard to Pesach. Just like with the mitzvot of Pesach, it's you're seeing that flash on that night that gives you a certain clarity, a certain sense of things being arranged in a Seder of a connection to Hashem. So too, the next day, when you're confronted with all your other mitzvot, yeah, yeah, okay. It's true, we had to be taken out of Egypt, but now take that taste with you to the next level. And that's the idea of, of the, 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 the connection between a ben Atam and the ben Achacham. But the Tam's answer is just, what's we had to be taken out of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. It's true, we weren't worthy then, and we're probably not worthy now. Yet, that's what Pesach is. Even if you don't feel worthy, Hashem says, come with me, I'm raising you to a high level. But to the ben Achacham, he's already asking, how am I going to get to the same place that I was um, on the night of the Seder, easy street with Diluc, with skipping, uh, pass, the, the, the passing over the, the Pesach is also the notion of kfitza, of, of jumping, of Diluc. How will I get there now at the next level, which is the, the slow climb? 
So the same thing like the idea of from the Mitzrayim, the Mitzrayim, the Straits, intellectually of trying to struggle with Darkusha, Darkalva Chomer, the Libun Halacha, trying to clarify it through a process that's much more arduous. So too, the Ben is asking about these particular mitzvot, how can I take them with me that they'll have something else, some resonance for me? i give you two more quick points and then we'll have to say goodbye. Uh, I probably won't do them justice, but okay. The Rasha, uh, it says in the, in the Tivot Shalom, um, um, in his um, work, this is actually quoted from a secondary work, he points out that the Ben Arasha, you know what the problem with the Ben Arasha is? Despair. He despairs. And uh, it, it's, it's written here, you know, basically he has this idea that he has uh, despaired in his possibility of ever reaching a connection to Hashem. Therefore, maybe for you, it's working. You can get close to God. I don't have any pathway forward. I don't have any, any uh, ability. I'm, I'm, I'm a lost cause, you know, whatever it is. You, I see all of you, you make it look so easy, you're able to do it, but I'm still struggling. Even at the Seder, I'm struggling. I'm already despairing of the possibility things could get better. And therefore, the answer there is, had that person been there, they actually... With that kind of despair, you wouldn't have been redeemed. The one thing that you need is the hope that even if you're on a very low level, the Jewish people were on a very low level, just like you're on a low level, but you have to have the hope that you can get out, right? You tell this, this, this uh, child, my dear child, had you been there with that kind of despairing attitude uh, that you're expressing, it wouldn't have been possible for you to be redeemed because you didn't have any ability to have to um, uh, experience the moment uh, for what it is, and to realize that, yes, it is an avoda, uh, a service that is sometimes arduous uh, in its process, but one that is well worth the, um, the engagement. Um, okay, the Tom we don't have time for already to see again. We saw something in the Tom, so I'll leave it there. One last thing is the, the, the Shana Daily Show. Uh, the idea here that one who does not ask questions, you should tell your child on that day, on account of this, did we leave Egypt? So there are a couple of ideas. It's a last point, but it's a, still a couple of ideas. The answer to the other sons uh, is um, each of them asked about some kind of change, something that happened. This child doesn't answer and ask any questions altogether. Even these props, even these elements are not uh, um, bringing about questions. So open it for them. Uh, you might have said, therefore, since we know this child either too young or too immature or too unsophisticated, that even these elements in front of us are actually not really bringing about any questions, maybe really we don't have to care about the time of when the Seder actually happens. Yachem Rosh Chorosh, let's start even two weeks earlier. It's the next line of the Haggadah. Look at the bottom of the screen here. Tamud Lomai, therefore it says, Bayam on that day. Okay, on that day, but literally on that day, maybe while it's still the daytime. A Seder is late at night. This year, you could say the Seder is going to be on a Saturday night. So on, let's say Shabbat, let's do it on Shabbos afternoon. It's after the clock change. It's late. It's very late. This child doesn't know the difference one way or the other. Let's make a Seder when it's good. We'll get the educational points in because a child can't really ask questions or won't really ask questions anyway. We'll do a mock Seder. It's good enough. You could have said that since all times are the same for that child, therefore the sages have a drasha. What do they say? For the Ben Shedan Yishol, the goddess says specifically, No, no, no. Davka when it's sitting in front of you. Davka when it's the time of the Seder. Yeah. If he got it to Levincha, was from Rosh or from while it's still daytime, another idea along the same lines, Lo'ayinu, that was from the Masi Hashem, and also uh, in the Abarbanel's Haggadah, in Zevach Pasach, uh, this one from the Haggadah of the Divrei Shol, okay? We wouldn't know that Ben Shein of Yishol, we should have said, he's not going to ask, and he won't uh, be away, uh, 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 involved, and in, interested in asking. But since this Chiyuv is only B'Shah Shematzim Maror, Munachim Lefanecha, uh, even if at that time the child is going to, uh, you know, is not actually going to ask any questions because they don't know how, because they can't, whatever it is. So therefore, at ptachlo, you have to be the one uh, to uh, to open it for them. How do you open it for them? Through these elements that are in front of you. The way to teach the child does not yet know how to ask is to show them the elements of the Seder while the Seder is going on. In other words, and not to say, I despair of connecting it to the elements of the Seder. So the first response is, don't think that all times are equal for this 
child, for this person at the Seder. Au contraire, there's something important, crucial about it being at the Seder itself. And secondarily, the idea, the second point, that you would have thought that um, the child is not asking because, you know, they, 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 um, the chiyuv the, the is maybe just to tell them the story without these elements. The elements are secondary because they didn't do the trick. Okay, so now apply, apply, use these. And if they still don't ask, don't ask, so then you have to open for them. How do you, how do you open it for them? So by, by pointing, by, in, by in being engaged with them, with these, these elements. I should point out also that aside from the questions that are being asked in the Haggadah by people in the Haggadah, Manishtana, Dalit Banim, we actually also have the questions that are being asked about the Seder, the narration of Seder, that's what Yachon Rosh Chodesh is. So maybe we should start, the, the Gemara is like theorizing, uh, this rather Chazal, Mechilta really, taking this and trying to analyze, maybe you can start from Rosh Chodesh. No, by Yom Ahu, it says right up here in the Pasuk. What about maybe while it's still the daytime in the 14th, before you get into the 15th of Nisan? No, Bav Zet has to be the demonstrative. Rabbi Shah, Sheesh, Matzah, Marv, Menachem, Lefanecha. This is all within what I would call the first Haggadah. Um, if we had more time, we could see it more structured, more globally. Let's just say that the element of Shela and Shuva, questions and answers, is very much front loaded into the first section of the Haggadah for good reason to try to whet the appetite and to create a dialogue that hopefully transcends not even the beginning part of the Seder, but then goes through the other parts of the Magid section, the part where we're going to be Doresh Arami Ovidah, we're going through the Pesukim, and then in the section from Gamliel of the Pesach Matzah Umara of pointing to each one and explaining each of the elements that it should also be, those should also be Bederach She'ela Uchuva. Last, last line, you're going to see an omission in the Haggadah. And you're going to wonder, oh, wait, something's weird here. The first part of the Haggadah starts Manishtana, and then the answer comes, we were slaves of Paro in Egypt, and it has the four sons, and there's questions and answers. The second section is the section known as the Haggadah, not of Shmuel, but the section of Rav. Rav says, we were um, uh, idolaters. Uh, uh, excuse me. The second section goes all the way until pretty much the end of the Dayenu. Find a question in that section, not one. There's one little section, okay, that's added in, the Rambam doesn't even have it in his Haggadah, where three Chachamim are trying to figure out how many Makot were Mitzrayim and how many were really at the Yamsuf. Okay, there's questions and answers. But it's not about question about the Seder, answer about the Seder. The Rambam did not have that section in his Haggadah, the Rav says that's because it was not germane to the night of the Seder. It's about miracles at the Yamsuf, and that's not the night of the Seder. The third section, Rabban Gamliel, again, is Pesach, Matzu, Mar. Pesach, Al Shuma. Why do we have the Pesach? And the answer. Matzah, Al Shuma. Here's the answer. Mar, Al Shuma. Each one has a question and answer. Section two, the meat and potatoes, like the body of the, the center part of which there is a beginning and an end, but the middle, the middle section, which is the drush of Arame Ovid Avi, explaining, unpacking each of the verses, right? We saw that before. Arame, I wonder Aramean was my forefather. Explain. We called out to Hashem. Explain. He brought us we had all these different uh, elements. He um, uh, answered our tefillot. Uh, we had a lot of str struggle. Uh, this is the Dever. This is the Cher. All the interpretations. No questions. My theory, and this is the punchline of the whole seer, is that the beginning was the wedding of the appetite. It was the aperitif to get us to a point where when we're in that middle section, the heart of the Haggadah, going through each of those psukim, here's what we see in the text of the Torah. Here's our interpretation of it on a homiletic level. It should bring about questions from the people sitting at the Seder. And the modeling is right there before. And then we have the section after the modeling of this one asks, this one asks, this one asks, this one asks, then comes the section we hope you'll ask. And then after that comes a section that is very much related to the Ben She'en Yodeli Shol. At Tachla, open it for them. Here's the Pesach, here's the Matzah, here's the Mower. Do you know why we have this? Do I have this? Do you know why I have this? And it's object-based, like the child who is, if they haven't asked the question, so now you have the elements in front of you and you can start to ask. Okay, that's all we have time for today. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stay around for another couple minutes. I don't know still wants to talk, but otherwise, Chakashi V'Sameach, next week, God willing, the Shabbat HaGadol Drasha in this slot, 9.30 in the morning, uh, uh, and then again, the same thing, Shabbos afternoon, 
in um, at, at Ortora, the time to be published, etc. Okay, Adkan for today.